And so we finish as we began, with Harold Wilson once again facing the Grand Inquisitor Robin Day in front of BBC television cameras. But this time there's a difference. It's the former Prime Minister Wilson who's asking the questions. Harold Wilson's fascination with television continued, and here we leave you with a chance to see him presenting his own television programme, Friday night, Saturday morning. And this episode of The Chat Show was first broadcast in 1979 and includes Winston Churchill, grandson of the wartime PM, comedian Mike Yarwood, and Mrs. Wilson, joining Robin for what is still the only chat show in British television history to be presented by a former Prime Minister. Now from me and all the team here at BBC Parliament, good night. Good evening. I've got three guests tonight. Mike Yarwood will be here, and three coaches have just drawn up outside with him filling them all. <laughs> Appearing as themselves, from the other side of the House of Commons, Winston Churchill, and the man who is usually on the other side of the desk when it comes to interviews, Robin Day. Now the tables are turned. <laughs> Robin, you were, went, you were once uh, described by a TV critic as that thoroughly unpleasant, unsmiling Mr. Day, scowling, frowning, glowering. Uh, now, uh, do you accept that, and are you going to scowl and frown and glower tonight? Well, that was George Scott in 1957, wasn't it? I thought it was 56. But yes, I think you're probably right. <laughs> um, no. No, I'm, I'm the soul of geniality, I as, thought so, as, yes. you have, as you have learned on so many of occasions. Of course, indeed, yes. <laughs> you didn't give me one, though, did you? Afterwards. <laughs> Robin, would you really rather be an MP, a minister, PM, than the job you do, or are you really happy? I'd in... much rather have become a member of Parliament at an early stage. Yes. I don't have any illusions that I'd have been a particularly distinguished MP, let alone a minister, but I'd like to have been in the House of Commons because I believe in Parliament. You never know. I mean, look at the people who have become ministers in both parties. <laughs> and, and, and Prime Ministers. Let me know. Uh, could I ask a personal question? That bow tie of yours, which we regret to see you're not wearing tonight. Well, I thought I'd give you something to talk about because you seem to be in difficulties last week. <laughs> well, I haven't had the chance of talking to you for a couple of hours like I have tonight. <laughs> but tell me, that bow tie, is it made up or do you tie it on each occasion? You'll be hearing from Lord Goodman in the morning. <laughs> if you make uh, observations like that, no, It wasn't course. an observation, it was a question. Now, Mr. Day, now I put a question up. I've learned a lot from you about questions. You're not dodging questions, are you, really? You must know that every question carries an observation within it. No, I, I wear... Oh, I'm learning something. Slowly. Yes. Uh, I, uh, I wear a bow tie because my father wore a bow tie and he taught me when, he was a, when I was a little boy and he wore one because some great statesman whose name I forget at the end of the 19th century wore one too. I wore one before I went on television. You did? But I'm not wearing one tonight. No, I noticed that. I, think we can leave I, can, I can go and get it if you like. No, 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 no. They, they can all recognise you. Yes. Uh, tell me, do you do all your own research? Yes, but I don't want to be unfair to people who do work on the programme because yeah. there's a great deal of material to be got for various programmes and people assemble it for me and I say, I want that white paper or what uh, Sir Harold said in his Brighton speech at line 243 on page... Uh, 312, and that's helpful if I don't have to actually find that myself. But there is thinking no, it through, I do myself. There is no page 312 for the Brighton Conference. <laughs> now, a few years ago, in an interview at a party conference, I think it was in Brighton, actually, now you mention it, 
You said I'd been leader of the party so many years, I can't remember how many it was at that time. And when was I going? This was in a public interview. I used to say that every year. Yeah, I used to. <laughs> Well, you got your way in the end, didn't you? <laughs> that I, was why you resigned. Of course. You bored me I, to know. I pointed out that you've been doing your job far, lo far longer than I'd been at number 10, and, and shouldn't you go first? Well, I did resign, but now three and a half years later, you're still there. Now, what about it? Well, that's very interesting because you've got the same theory, really, as, as Ted Heath, because he once uh, spoke at a, at a conference about the media and so on, and he said uh, he had a theory that... Uh, uh, political leaders weren't kicked out because they were bad political leaders, but because the public were bored by them, being interviewed continually by the same boring television interviewers. <laughs> uh, and so Ted, he thought it very much better to replace the television interviewers rather than replace the political leaders. Do you agree? I think there must be an answer to do you that. Agree with, do you agree with what he said? Well, I can't case. honestly think of an answer to it. Well, <laughs> you don't agree with it? Well, I, I, it seems to me to have a, an utterly impregnable logic. I don't agree with it myself, I say. Uh, now, for a long time, you've been a strong supporter of televising, uh, of Parliament, I think, and so have I. Uh, do you think it, this would be good for democracy, or do you think it might encourage, uh, I mean, I'm sure it's inconceivable, a certain degree of exhibitionism and showing off in the chamber? I don't think it would encourage any more exhibitionism than there is anyway. Um, I want, you know, what you can don't recall... Don't underrate MPs. Yes, but you see, if, if some members of Parliament did some of the silly things which they do sometimes, and uh, you know as well as I do that the number of silly things which go on in Parliament are, are relatively rare. Most of it is very businesslike and polite. Yeah. But occasionally there's someone who does something silly. If they did that on, on television, it was seen by their constituents. Yeah. Some of their constituents would be, <clears throat> would be very ashamed. I think that, I think that is, is a, a very fair point. Uh, one thing for certain, I mean, there'll be far more MPs sitting in the chamber, I think, for the debate, Yes, but I think it? this would be to begin with. I think after a time, yeah. everyone will get used to it. But the important uh, but thing is... But they'd have a bigger job explaining to their constituents yeah. that a lot of the work of an MP is in committees upstairs, the, uh, all the select committees of the House. Well, so, some of them yeah. may get to be televised eventually when we have that more would be fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. But the important thing is it would put people out of me like, a, out, out, like me out of a job for much of the time, and I think that's a good thing because it's very silly that anyone should judge a prime minister or a minister by how he performs in a television interview with a non-elected person. No, but surely, I mean, in fact, you'd be able to be freer to comment on it rather than have to tell people what has been said so, yes. in the and House. there'd be the recesses yeah. and there'd be general elections. Now, I think you support the radio, the House. I, I, I'm worried about it. I, I did support it. It was first put in as an experiment when I was prime minister. And I used to listen to it, uh, not, not my own question time, obviously, but let's say on a Wednesday when I wasn't answering questions. And it sounded to me uh, most unfair to the opposition of the day, whoever they might be. In that case, it was the Conservatives. Because they were shouting and yelling. And they sounded like yahoos on radio, whereas there was a very serious minister giving his very serious answers. I'm sure it would be exactly the same now, the other way around, with uh, Labour on the opposition benches. And therefore, I agree with you in wanting to see television. On the whole, I'd be against uh, the reimposition of radio. I wouldn't stop the radio. I don't think it's been very successful because I don't think it's been done in the right way. I think it was a mistake to concentrate only on Prime Minister's question time, which is not a very typical thing, and which has deteriorated in quality. As you know very well, having been in Parliament since 1945, it's a much less uh, successful I agree. question I agree. and answer than it used to be. I agree, because all the questions are, will he visit Charlton come Hardy, or wherever, a very good place to visit, of course. Right, right. Uh, and then the questions might be something about what's happening in Scotland, Wales, Ireland, or, or, or foreign affairs. Or uh, what are his engagements for today? And when you've given that answer, you'll then get something like a quarter of an hour of questions on anything under the sun. He's the only minister who isn't told what sort of area he'll be covering. Therefore, he's got to live on his wits. And I agree with you that it has made that quarter of an hour, Tuesday and Thursday, less, uh, less uh, valuable. But um, do you think... A lot more people would uh, be watching television sometime during the day if Parliament was televised than I think it's supposed to be, isn't it, about a quarter of a million listen to Question Time on the radio? Well, I don't know how many people would watch it and I don't advocate it as mass entertainment. I advocate it purely as a public service. I think people have a right to see their Parliament in action, either 
uh, when it's broadcast live, if it is, if they're free to do so, or extracts in the news bulletins or in special recordings later on. I remember an Iron Bevan saying to me, and he was one of the first people who really wanted to do it. Yes, he was. Um, saying, if, if there's the Scottish teachers' superannuation bill, then Scottish teachers ought to be able to watch it. Yeah. Now, in the 1959 election, uh, you stood, I think, as a Liberal candidate. Was it 59? Yeah. Uh, for Hereford. Uh, if you were standing now, would you still stand as a Liberal? No. Uh, first of all, I think uh, you ought to be aware of something called the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act, uh, <laughs> in, in which it's not right to refer to some offence or misdemeanour long ago in someone's youth. <laughs> And I think your reference to my Liberal candidate is as bad are. taste as it would be to me to refer to you as when you were an active Liberal in Oxford before yeah, you decided that the Labour Party was the way to power. Or indeed old, old young Winston's grandfather. No, 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 no actually, actually I may say, I think this may have come up last week, I went to one meeting of the Labour Party and there were all those public school Marxists and I'd never read Marx and still haven't and got sick of the whole idea. Yes, I joined the Liberals but I found that uh, they didn't fit what I wanted and in the end I came back to the senior, uh, you know, the more grown-up, not undergraduate Labour uh, Party. Uh, but, um, so you regard that as really what a, a useful piece of enthusiasm rather than... Yes, that. I was yes. brought up as a Liberal and I wanted mm. to have a go at standing for Parliament. I don't regret standing for Parliament because it's a useful thing to to have to stand up in a town, uh, town square and uh, yeah. deal with a big audience. Well, what do, you, what do you think about the power of television now? I mean, we have seen the power of American television bring down a president. It was, uh, I think. Which president was that? Nixon. Don't think... Uh, you don't think it was television? No. Why, why was it television? Well, I mean, everyone saw him sort of crack under it. You think, you think it would have gone sooner or later to you anyway? With, with, with respect, I think that what brought down Nixon was what he did himself and the decisions of the, mainly the decision of the Supreme Court in insisting that he gave up the But do you think that... Uh, he British wouldn't have gone otherwise. Do you think British television, anyway, has got too much power uh, in influencing politics? Too little, or have we got it about right? I think it, we've got it about right. I don't think uh, it influences people. Um, an individual programme may influence people, say, about a problem of, uh, um, a problem of homeless people or some scandal. But in terms of the political scene and the political balance, I think on the whole it's uh, reasonably fair and people make up their own minds. I think all the evidence, I'm not, much, not very keen on this academic research into how people vote, I don't really believe in it, but insofar as there is any, it seems to show that television cancels itself out. It's so fair, or perhaps so boring, I don't know. I, yes, well, I was always rather against the party politicals at the end, uh, towards the end of my time. I'm in favour of them. I think they tend to be, they can be very boring yes, indeed. Yes, but the point is, so long as the parties have their own outlet, which they can do their own thing on, then it means that the ordinary current affairs journalistic programmes can then be freer to ask difficult questions and raise difficult issues. Once I gather you uh, were studying for the bar. Yes. And you, you've still got those qualifications. I was presumably. called to the bar, yes. You were called to the bar. Yeah. Do you think you'd have made more money if you'd gone to the bar? Um, I, I'm not saying whether you... It's, uh, you mean, whether I'd make more, if I was a successful uh, barrister now, would I be making more money than I am now? Mm. Um, probably if I were a very successful barrister, and I don't think I, I would have been, uh, I would be earning more money. Because the very successful barrister mm. now earns six figures. And I'd, <laughs> let me assure you, don't uh, earn that. Um, but I think, I don't think I would have been a very successful barrister because the really successful barristers are very good lawyers, um, infinitely more profound legal brain than I ever had. I think you do modest there. I mean, if I had to, a big legal case, I'd rather have been on my side than against. Well, if it had been, a, if you're visualising something which one finds it rather difficult if you're being accused of a rather, rather squalid crime at the Old Bailey or, or something a civil like case. That. None of us can visualise that. You make that. more money in civil cases, not criminal. Indeed, but uh, you, you said on your side, oh, I see what you mean. Mm. But I wouldn't have been... <laughs> I, I don't think I'd have done very well. If I had been anywhere, I'd have probably been a, a kind of rump hole of the Bailey. I'm now a rump hole of the Beeb, I think. Yes, <laughs> now, talking about the Beeb, uh, you've, uh, you've been at the Beeb. Uh, I mean, you've been very loyal there, but have you ever really wanted to be in the other programme? 
ITV? Mm -hmm. Well, I started in ITV you started at, there. Uh, at, for, in 1955. That's where I began. I've forgotten that. I was there for four years, then went to the BBC. I've stayed with the BBC. Uh, Man and boy. Because they've, uh, they've uh, for 20 years, um, because there are more programmes of the kind that I do on the BBC, though I've often talked with the other side, because I believe in yeah. competition, I believe in the to and fro. You're happy about the fact there is television. Would you like to see more television? Uh, so, more competition, I mean? Uh, yes, I think I'd like to see a, a, a fourth channel, because like, I think more competition in the world of information and, and, uh, and indeed entertainment, if you like, is good for everybody. Now, uh, still a very young man. <coughs> well, I am, or you yeah. are? You? Oh, <coughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm getting on. Yes, but what is your ambition now? Well, I'm not really very ambitious. I'm not trying to av avoid your, your question. I would like to go on doing what I do as well as I can and hope to be of some use to people. I've never been one of those people who wanted a great deal of power. I don't, uh, I'm not under illusion that I have a great deal of power because everything I do works within a context of uh, BBC rules and so on and so forth. I would like to go on doing what but I do well. You've got more power than the journalist writing in a newspaper, don't you feel? Because people see you and listen to you. Well, I'm not you're sure... Three you're a three-dimensional figure on a two-dimensional screen. I'm not sure that I uh, agree with that. It depends which journalist you're talking about. An editorial, as you know, because you got very angry about them, um, can, can be very stinging. If I, when I, for instance, was interviewing you as Prime Minister, first of all, I don't decide that you come on. You decide whether you want to come on, and the BBC decides whether to invite you. They then decide whether... <laughs> and usually, usually they, they would um, well, <coughs> find, find, it was you, find that yes, they were ready to have the Prime of Minister course. on. Then they would decide who they wanted to interview you. It might be me, it might not. It might be me. If it were me, I would then have to decide... Oh, they would tell me whether it was you or not, and if it was, I, of course I said yes. Flattery won't help you in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, fact, then the question areas, I discuss them with my editor. And the only area of power, I would prefer to call it responsibility, is when we're on the air live and you are, supposing you were in your desk at Downing Street and I'm asking you a question, you give me a, an answer which I hadn't expected or raise it, raises some new point which I wasn't aware of, then I have to decide what to do about it. And nobody has briefed me on that and nobody has told me what to ask. If, of course, I ask some stupid, ignorant or offensive question, then I wouldn't be asked to do it again. So you summarise it then, responsibility without power. I would say responsibility and a, a share of the power which the media has within certain strict rules. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> In a moment, I'll be talking to Winston Churchill and later Mike Yellwood. But before that, a musical interlude with those choral scholars turned pop singers, Regali. Love, careless love, do come home. Careless love, careless love, do come home. I'll weep like a widow and alone like a dove. Careless love.
raindrops keep falling on my head. Keep and just keep back the guy who's here to be for his bed. Nothing seems to fit, it seems to go. Raindrops are falling on my head, they keep falling. So I just did me some doggy sun and stockings. And I said I didn't like the way. Keep falling on my head, but I'm not gonna cry. That doesn't mean my eyes are slowly turning red. Cries up for me, cobs. I'm never gonna stop the rain by complaining because I'm free. Nothing's worrying. That was Rick Arley. Now the man with probably the most revered name in the world, Winston Churchill. <laughs> Winston, I don't know if you heard that, but I referred to you as the man with the most revered name in the world. And he referred to me as old young Winston. Yes. <laughs> well, is that uh, an advantage or a disadvantage to have your grandfather's name? Well, I suppose it gets one invited on the Harold Wilson chat show. <laughs> That's not why I invited you, as you will find out before we finish. No, it gets one into all sorts of awkward scrapes, I must say. I found myself covering the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 1968 as a newspaper man for the London Evening News. And uh, on my way to the hotel, there was a sort of riot situation outside, and about 200 police and... 300 National Guardsmen, and a policeman tried to stop me going into the hotel and said, uh, where do you think you're going? I said, I'm going to my room. And uh, he said, what's your name? And I'm not in the habit of telling lies to policemen <laughs> or indeed to anybody. And so I told him. And I was absolutely flabbergasted by the reaction. He pulled his nightstick, whacked me over the head. He thought I was taking the mickey out of him. Like if it's a Charlie Chaplin or something like that, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Now, you've uh, got around the world a great deal. You've just mentioned that particular thing you were covering. You've been where? Yemen, the Congo, Angola, all the wars you've uh, reported before you came into the House. Uh, you sat on the front bench for a time in uh, opposition. Uh, I would naturally have assumed you'd have been in the Cabinet, and I'm not making any critical comments on the appointments of uh, Cabinets by Mrs Thatcher or anybody else. <laughs> uh, she's got some surprisingly good people. I mean, you know, they suddenly taken on a new life, and they, they look bigger than they did in opposition. This very often happens, I think. But um, you got your... I mean, you were sitting on the opposition front bench, and, and I think you were sort of pushed off it, weren't you? I mean, because you took a certain line on the question of Rhodesia, about which you feel strongly. I pushed myself off it by the position I insisted on taking this time a year ago on Rhodesian sanctions, and uh, I was fired. Well, I, personally, I may say, I think that's wrong. I mean, uh, I uh, tried to keep our party together for God knows how many years now, and I did it by having all the extremes in the cabinet and then sort of uh, tried to keep the speed going sufficiently so they didn't know whether they were I wouldn't necessarily agree that you were right, actually. You would not? No. But do you think, Mrs. I Tech think you compromised a bit too much. I won't embarrass you by asking... <laughs> I didn't compromise. <laughs> I, uh, I won't embarrass you by asking whether you think Mrs. Thatcher was right, but uh, I would like to have seen you there. Now Rhodesia is coming to a head. What do you feel about it? I feel that people haven't really appreciated that this is something uh, about something much wider than Rhodesia itself. It's about the whole future of southern Africa and many millions of people, black and white alike, because 
the way Rhodesia goes will dictate the way South Africa goes. If the white South Africans can see that there is a constitutional multiracial government coming to power in Rhodesia, which has the backing and support of the West, and that law and order is maintained, constitutional government is maintained. I think this will give them the confidence to make a very major step forward, uh, which I think, and I know you think, is absolutely indispensable. <coughs> if they see that the arrangements that are made lead within a space of two or three years to chaos, I think Henry Kissinger called it convent time in the context of Vietnam, that there had to be a decent interval of something like a year between the withdrawal of the last marine division from Vietnam and the rape of the first nuns in a Catholic convent. And I think that in the context of Rhodesia, if the government, uh, if the British government is able to come to uh, an arrangement which is acceptable not just to the Americans and the Europeans but to a large part of uh, the peoples of Africa as well, uh, which provides for a constitutional government not a handover to Marxist terrorism, then I think something really worthwhile will have been achieved. But I fear there's a real danger that we could be in a situation which will stand up for only two or three years. Mr. Mugabe and Mr. Nkomo say, of course we accept the Constitution. But they have, at the same time, they've professed on many occasions that they want a one-party Marxist yeah. state, and the two can't stand together. Well, you just mentioned America. I mean, and uh, you and I remember that... Uh, Many times in the past, American presidents said, we know nothing about Africa, you tell us. Like in the case of Nigeria, they phone me at 2 o'clock in the morning. They always forget that five-hour difference in American presidents. But in the case of uh, Rhodesia, then there was a change with the present president, President um, Carter. Uh, they, uh, then this fellow Andrew Young gets loose. Now, wouldn't you agree, I think we've both said this, that Andrew Young's proposals for Rhodesia have just been a disaster? Well, I wouldn't blame Andrew Young. This was not just Andrew Young. It was also the British Foreign Office and the American State Department. This was what they wanted to see, and their plan provided for the handover of uh, security to the terrorists in Rhodesia. Well, and that would be a total disaster. That's your worry, my worry. But uh, I must say, uh, I really think that President Carter could have taken a leaf out of your book. I mean, the way that you floated uh, your Andy Young off into the North Sea as Secretary of State for Energy was absolutely masterly because <laughs> uh, Wedgwood Ben and Andy Young are people who, because of the support that they have in different quarters, are virtually unsackable. And you saw that, and so you promoted him sideways. Well. Mr. Carter, <laughs> of course, should have made Andy Young... Mr. Carter should have made Andy Young uh, Secretary for Eskimo Affairs or something Alaska. like that instead of firing. No, Alaska, Alaskan oil would have been on. Absolutely, yeah. same thing. Well, actually, I said to Tony Benn when I moved him, he wasn't very pleased, I may say. I thought he was going to resign, but he didn't. And I, I, I said, look, I want you to use your energy on energy. I mean, get all the oil you can out of the North. He did a very good job there, in fact. Very good job. But uh, surely, I mean, I think what we're both worried about is the idea of the leaders of the terrorists getting into a so-called constitutional government. Yes. I, I, I mean, mean Mugabe, I mean Nakoma. I think the, what would be really unacceptable to the great majority of people in this country would be to see a situation where power is handed over to Marxist terrorists, and this would... armed by the Soviet Union. Yeah. And, uh, of course, today the Rhodesian security forces are 80% black, uh, I would hate to think what would be the fate of those 80% blacks in the Rhodesian security forces if Mugabe or Nkomo's forces were to take over. And, as you say, that would, I, I think you're right, that would make it much more difficult to see South Africa begin to move into the 20th century if they saw uh, bloodshed on that sort of scale as they would. They must be given Rhodesia. confidence yeah. to move forward. Now, you've just referred to the Soviets interfering in Africa. They are, of course. Uh, they are uh, very active at the moment in what used to be called Abyssinia and Ethiopia. But I sometimes get the impression, I don't know whether you are like some other members of your party here, or indeed of my party, 
the, there's a tendency now to say that the Russians are baddies, well, all right, they're the Warsaw Pact, they are our adversaries, we uh, are NATO, but uh, because the Chinese dislike these baddies, the Chinese must be goodies. Now, my view, let me ask you yours, my view is that the Chinese are just as thoroughgoing communists as the Russians, uh, only they do it more nicely, they're more bland, and uh, in fact, the Russians are looking to me now more like a lot of rather privileged czarists, I think, uh, than uh, old-fashioned communists, and I'd be more worried about China than a lot of people seem to be both in Britain and America, or are you happy about China as the as neutralizing Russia, so to speak. Well, of course, I'd like to see a democracy in China, there's no question. But I think that one's got to decide what is the threat to the people of Britain, to the people of Western Europe and the NATO alliance. And it isn't communism. It is, above all today, Soviet imperialism. The, relative, I, power, Zarism, Zarism. the relative power of China to the Soviet mm. Union is as of 100 uh, to one in favor of the Soviet Union in raw military terms. And I, quite frankly, Today. would sell the Chinese, the communist Chinese, anything in the way of military equipment which couldn't reach us. Now, couldn't I come to one last question? In 1967, uh, I, your father and you, I think, published a book, wasn't it, about the, uh, an appreciation of the Six-Day War in the Middle That's East? Right. You've always taken, haven't you, a, I won't say, a, uh, uh, an unremitting, unthinking pro-Israeli line, but on the whole, you have, I think, haven't you, rather uh, been keen of the, for the success of the State of Israel? Of course, I've been very keen for the success of the State of Israel, but I wouldn't say that it's been a, a blinkered support. Uh, I've also made it my business when I was a newspaper man, and more recently since I've been involved in politics, to talk to both sides, to go to both sides. I've got Many friends in uh, East Jerusalem as well, well as West Jerusalem yeah. on the West Bank. Yeah, quite... And uh, I think what I find sad uh, is the idea, which in fact very few Israelis subscribe to, although many people think they do, that uh, the state of Israel has to be created at the expense of the Arabs. I think yeah. that there is plenty enough I, I'm land bit, and... I'm a bit worried about Begin, and I think you perhaps are too about some things, yes. But, I've been writing a book about uh, these, uh, the history of this, and I said there were two heroes in uh, the whole Israeli story. One was President Truman, and the other was Winston Churchill, senior, of course. And you would agree with that, wouldn't you? I mean, your grandfather, without him, probably, at a very critical time, more than one critical time, without him, there would probably never have been a From the very beginning, right from his yeah. early friendship with Weizmann in Manchester, uh, in, uh, soon after the turn of the century. He became an ardent pro-Zionist and champion of the state of Israel. There's no question now, there. now one very short question. Uh, all right, you're not in the cabinet for the moment. What is your ambition in politics now? I'm very happy representing the people of Stretford and I'm delighted that at each election you come up to support me. You came up in 1970 and spoke in Trafford Park. You came up again in 1974 and I'm afraid uh, there was an unfortunate incident, uh, not the Stretford Enders for once getting no. out of hand, but one of our police horses reversed under uh, Lady Wilson's foot. That's right. Uh, and you came up again. I'm sure you're not in You came up again in this uh, election to support me. Uh, you think I'd be very helpful? Uh, there's no question of it. Uh, you're warmly welcome in my constituency, and I count it a, a very great asset that you should continue to play me the compliment of coming up. But if I could interject... I do uh, my best. I mean, I'm glad you feel it's helpful, yes. But if I could ask you <laughs> one question, Sir Harold. Could you explain why it is that you have forsaken the leadership of your party, the premiership of this country, which um, Dr. Kissinger the other day described political power, I think, as the greatest, uh, the ultimate aphrodisiac. And you have abandoned it to become a, a telepundit. Now, my grandfather... <laughs> my grandfather, even at the age of 80, he had to be dragged off the stage. Yes. He didn't go unwillingly, and he certainly wouldn't have given away to an elder man. No, but how old was he when he began to be Prime Minister? He was qualified to draw the old age pension. He was he 65. I was 48. Now... The short answer is, it, uh, it's a very, very long time. 
uh, in the 60s, I had uh, a team, none of them had ever been in a camp before, hardly. I had to sort of put them to bed, wash the nappies, <laughs> give them the bath and teach them everywhere. And of course, it was a much more highly trained team that came in. And I felt it was uh, time for me to give way and let one of a very enthusiastic group of people who liked my job go and have it. So that I could enjoy myself and write and think and, to follow you, to uh, look after my constituency. But now better, that you've had I'm a rest, doing. yes. Yeah. Uh, why not come back? I mean, they're in a bit of a mess now, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a very good question, Mr. Day. I propose not to... Uh, I propose to look it straight in the face and pass on. You say it's an arrow of Millen. That's a great compliment. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. And now, before I welcome Mr. Yarwood, a song at the piano from the young American singer, Dean Friedman. This is a lullaby of sorts to put little noxious brats to sleep. If I was a cannibal, I'd tell you what I'd do. I'd chop you up with little onions, and I'll fix it for a stew. And if you don't go to bed, I'm gonna sell you to the zoo. But I'll never babysit for you again. If I was a crocodile, I'd tell you what I'd do. I'd take a bite out of your leg, and I would slowly start to chew. And you'd never walk again. You'd always have to use a cane, but I'll never babysit for you again. to bedtime watching Dracula meets the creature from the mud now don't give me no more lip don't tell me just a sec what the heck I'll bite your neck and drink your blood well if I was a python I'd tell you what I'd do I'd wrap myself around you till you turn three shades of blue and if you don't go to bed well heaven knows what I will do but I'll never babysit for you I'll never babysit for you I'll never babysit for you <laughs> again. That was Dean Friedman. This is Mike Yarwood. Well, how are you coping with the new government? Well, what was your name again? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, Robin, you did better research than that. <laughs> I, in answer to, to, to Sir Harold's question, how am I coping with the new government, I, I could answer that with the question, you as the opposition, how are you coping with the new government? <laughs> but uh, having said that, I've lost my voice. And not only that, I've lost everybody else's voices as well. Um, that doesn't help. Um, what has happened is I've, I've developed this sort of laryngitis problem, and uh, therefore I, I'm therefore not able to imitate this evening, which is a great relief to those who are victims to my <coughs> addiction to mimicry. So I've got to make that point very clear. <laughs> I feel a little easier already. Well, yes, but uh, people say to me, they say, uh, well, uh, would you sign an autograph, which is a great privilege, and they say, don't sign it Harold Wilson, will you? And things like that. <laughs> you don't do Harold Wilson with a raincoat. I say, well, I do him with a raincoat, but I can't find the man who makes them. <laughs> um, one makes those sort of sat satirical remarks. Well, I, I read that um, not long ago, some uh, young ladies were trying to get you to stay and entertain them. Was it in Victoria Street or somewhere around there? 
Um, and you said you got a cabinet meeting in half an hour and a late night sitting in the house, is that that's right? That's right. Well, I was asked uh, on my out, way out of the uh, stage door pub opposite the um, Victoria Palace, uh, and I was about to leave to go back to rehearsals, and they said, yeah, Mike, come on, give us Harold. And I didn't feel like doing it, you know, and I, I just said, look, I have a cabinet meeting uh, in the morning, and uh, I don't wish to... Uh... <laughs> I do not wish to detain my colleagues, so therefore would you not bother me? And uh, I have no time for that sort of... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the kill your is... throat now. Oh, yes. Well, I doubt it. But you see, the point is... The point I'm trying to make, actually, is that... I'd actually said to these, these young ladies that... No, I was not prepared to do an impersonation of Harold Wilson. But I did it in your voice. So, therefore, I did do an impersonation of you, but in actual fact, I said no and yes at the same time. That's the point I'm trying to make. That pipe was given me by an American president. Not the one you were asking about before, his successor. Yeah. But uh, I remember once you coming to number 10. We, we used to have a party at Christmas the last two years for terribly sick children. I remember some who came in 74 had actually died by 75. And their parents brought them. And a number of people from your distinguished profession all came along to help. And uh, the, on the second occasion, I made a little speech of thanks for all those people who were coming. And you were behind some rather beefier members of your profession. I couldn't <laughs> see you. I said, Mike Yarwood is, I think, uh, g going to uh, come, but I don't think he's here. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you said, uh, you, you, you sort of made yourself... Well, uh, I, I interrupted you. You uh, said, yes. Yeah, I said, uh, I used to live here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, your, your, your wife was standing, standing next to me and I said, uh, I'd love to do this thing when, when, when the Prime Minister stands up. I'd love to sort of heckle him as Edward Heath. Uh, would he be offended? And, she, uh, and your wife said, Mary said, no, oh, shit, no problem, do it, you love it. And that's what we did. And, and those parties, uh, are, it's an annual event, you know, at uh, uh, Downing Street every year for the handicapped children. It's got nothing to do with um, social climbing, as, as sometimes the press make out. It is an actual fact for the handicapped children. And I, 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 I've only ever been to Downing Street twice in my life, once when you were Prime Minister <laughs> and once when... Jim Callaghan was Prime Minister, and we did the same party. And, he, and we had a lot of fun, and the kids enjoy it, and that's the main thing. Well, I, I was asking you how you're coping with the change of government, and your throat trouble is <coughs> making it difficult, but who are you finding difficult? I, I mean, Willie Whitelaw to be... Well, in fact, I think you've got a Whitelaw, haven't you, but... Well, Je Geoffrey Howell, Keith Joseph, Fire. I would say that... Um, Mrs Thatcher is the most difficult one, so... Well, <laughs> you've get, got... Uh, Supplementation of staff. I, I, I that do one indeed. Yet. I have the assistant, uh, assistance of Miss Janet Brown to uh, help me with that problem. Uh, I don't know who is going to help the Tory party with the problem with Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> um, I, I don't mean that really, in a, you know, to be sort not of. Not political, of course. No, not political. This is not a political program. Yeah. I think I made that clear, didn't I? <laughs> didn't you say that, Robin? I haven't said a word. Well, <laughs> that then is, must be the most first thing that's ever happened on television. <laughs> no, I, I, I've been tackling this government, uh, I, I, this throat problem at the moment. I, I'd planned uh, to come along and, and do a few little trailers for you. Tomorrow night we have a show, of course. Uh, but we, well, I'm not doing a plug, but it's pre-recorded, and therefore, at the time of recording, uh, my voice was in, in, in uh, you know, in working order. So therefore, there's no problem. But um, yes, they are a problem. But if you think about people like Willie Whitelaw, you see, there again, there again, you see, you, you have a, a character to go to, and you know, <laughs> let's be perfectly honest about this, Harold. <laughs> We are now an inherited, or, or, or have in fact inherited, uh, a terrible mess left behind by your government. And, and, and quite frankly, we're trying to clear it up. And what are you doing? Well, that's one you've mastered, but uh, who, who are you finding difficult? 
I'm finding a uh, great idea. I, 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 I've had a Norman St. John Stevens, you say. <laughs> I've had a Norman Sinjins Davis. Uh, I've, had, I've done a, a Jim Pryor, which is very like that and very deep and quite easy to imitate. Uh, and I, we've done, oh, uh, there was the other chat called, oh, just shows you how famous they are. Keith Joseph. <laughs> Keith Joseph is not famous, sir, with respect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Where have you got information from him? <laughs> no, I, I, with respect to Keith Jones, no. He uh, um, is, is a difficult character to, to get a sort of a look-alike. With our television shows, what we try to do is get what we call look-alikes, you, know, uh, uh, you know. Try and sound like them, by all means, but try and look like them as well. That's what television is all about. And, and this government, I'm, I'm easing myself in gently you know, uh, and easily to them. Uh, and hoping that eventually I will, in fact, uh, uh, perfect. That's not really the word I want, perfect, because you never actually get a, a perfect reproduction of the person. Although, in fact, I think the nearest thing I ever came to was, was Robin, in fact, uh, in terms of voice-wise, you know. I think you do Esther Ransom very well. <laughs> you have no right to look through windows. Is there a difference between a Tory voice and a Labour voice? I think so, yes. You see, um, I think that possibly it depends on which school you went to. And I, I, this is not inverted snobbery or chip on the shoulder or any of that sort of thing. There are a lot of hoorays in the, in the Labour Party, believe you me. Uh, hooray is a, a word we use in the theatre, means somebody who's terribly well spoken, that sort of chap, you know, uh, Eaton, Harrow, that sort of thing. And of course there are. Uh, I'm going back to Willie Whitelaw again. Uh, sorry. Uh, I, I've got this obsession with Willie Whitelaw, you know. It's easier than having an obsession with Janet Brown. But, um, <laughs> no, yes, there is. Because, you see, uh, you yourself uh, have a slight Yorkshire accent. I say a slight Yorkshire accent. It isn't a thick Yorkshire accent. And it helped. Uh, but... Um, I don't know really. The, the, the Conservative. It doesn't government... help him when it comes to Lancashire. Well, Lancashire, you see, there are so many, as you know, Winston, there are so many different La La Lancastrian dialects. I mean, you go to uh, Manchester, Stretford, your constituency. And Liverpool isn't Manchester at all, really, is it? Well, no, of course not. It my, isn't. my constituency. Well, yes, but of course not where you came from. No, no, I can't. Let me correct you. <laughs> I went to live on Moses Head when I, I was 16. I know where you yes, went to. 16. <laughs> Yes, I believe so. People think uh, yourself and Frankie Vaughan came from Liverpool. I don't know why I made a comparison. I suppose it's because you both sort of kick your leg out, you know. <laughs> Possibly in different directions, left or right, I don't know. No, the thing is that people think you like Frankie Vaughan comes from Liverpool. He doesn't. He comes from Yorkshire, he comes from Leeds. You yourself come from Huddersfield, but your constituency is Liverpool. And, of course, the Liverpool accent, of course, is very, very prominent. It's very strong. You say something, somebody at the moment uh, that's interesting me with, uh, you know, with great uh, enthusiasm is Eric Heffer. You know. Yeah. Coming man. I thought there'd be a pause when I mentioned a his coming name. Man. Yes. <laughs> I said a coming man. A coming man, yes. The only but... chap you sacked, really. No, he resigned. You sacked him. Oh, I did sack him, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, I think that was why you well, got your knighted. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I said was that uh, any minister who voted uh, on, on that issue the, the, the market, w w would be in trouble, and, and he did. Yeah. Like I, me. No, I think that you said it uh, and, and made it quite clear. Uh, and I, 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 I always hoped that other leaders of parties or governments would have said the same thing. That I do not want to be surrounded by, and you said this, I do not want to be surrounded by yes men. And Heffer and Ben and people like that, I, I, I speak with them, to call them their surnames, it's word economy because of my throat. Uh, yes, I think when you're running the country, you don't want yes men. He's not you, a yes Ben, certainly, no. <laughs> well, of course not. And you don't want people who are yes men. You want people who will serve the party and serve the country uh, to the best of their ability. Uh, that's my own viewpoint if we're talking politics. If we're talking show business, that's a totally different thing. Yes, of course, 
Eric Heffer, people like that are very mimicable and um, very, you know, people you can caricature. Have we heard Eric Heffer from you? No, you haven't. I thought I'd missed it. It's coming, is it? Well, you see, um, I, well, it, it, it takes time. You see, I, I, worry, I worry a great deal about when we're doing the shows and we have our planning meetings with the script writers and the producers, I think to myself, they say, you must put an Eric Heffer in here or you must put a... Um, uh, what's the chat with the moustache, the Royds, uh, the Winston? Rhodes Boyston. Oh, yes, I don't know. Uh, forgive him if he's watching, I don't remember his name. He is very mimicable. But I said, it's all very well, but would the public know that person? And I am only as good... They will as... soon. Yes. Well, I, well I always, we have a theory on the show, if they're not famous, we'll make them famous. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to you? That's just... <laughs> I was just going to ask you. Yes. <laughs> But, uh, look, do you really, I mean, just, do you just study your victims, as it were, from the outside, look at their mannerisms, their voice and so on, or do you in some way try to get inside their personality, try to be them for a moment? Yeah, first of all, I don't like the word victims. You once had a, um, an alternative uh, word for that, I think, when we did a Michael Parkinson show together, and you called them the clientele, you know. Uh, I, I, I look at, you know, when I, I look down the list and I say to our researchers on the show, who haven't we impersonated recently? I say, would you get out my honours list? <laughs> and we have a long list of people we've impersonated. Not bad taste, that remark. I wouldn't have thought so. On. Only bad taste, Mr. Day, because you drew attention to them. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, oh, I've lost my thread completely. <laughs> And you were talking I, about your honours list. Well, I can assure you, you will not be in it, Mr. Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would, because you're delightful. He's been making me laugh all evening, actually, because I've lost my throat. No, I study the people. Obviously, of course, you have to study the people. Um, but we have to look in terms of, do the, the, the viewers know a particular person? And there's no point in doing a Henry Kissinger or a President Sidat, just because I feel I can get inside that person. Wow. In answer to your question, yes, I can get inside, I can study them, I can research, but if the, the viewing audience say, well, we don't watch President Sadat or, or, or Mr. Begin or, or whatever, uh, then of course I'm lost, I'm, I'm lost completely. Yeah. Well, could I put one last question to you? Because You've been around quite a while. I mean, you still look young and are young, of course, but <laughs> some of the characters you've been doing for a long time now must have changed quite a bit over the years. Has this been a problem for you? Have they changed? Voices changed? Mannerisms changed? Um, Length of speech has grown? Yes, it's happening now. <laughs> that was what I meant? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, uh, I once did a sketch where I did a... They, you know they made a film about your great-grandfather? Everybody calls him your grandfather, My right? grandfather, I mean, no, I, I mean your great-grandfather. Uh, yeah, I mean that in a complimentary way. Um, uh, of course, he's your grandfather. But they did a film, Young Winston. Yeah. And somebody said to me, if you were offered a film, Young Harold, uh, would you play the part? I said I'd be very disappointed if I didn't get the part. Because in actual fact, we once did a sketch where I played a young Harold and a present-day Harold, you see. Because you used to be dark and you had a moustache, you see. And your voice was much more high-pitched. <laughs> and you were a minister of the Board of Trade in the Atta government at the time, and you had a very sharp moustache, and you were very... Came handsome. off on the 2nd of September, 1949. Correct. <laughs> because Herbert Morrison was always confusing Hilary Marquand and me, and so I had an argument. I said, you've had your moustache longer, you should take it off. He said, no, I'm there first, my moustache has got squatters rights, you shave yours off. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, um... <laughs> As I was saying when I was interrupted. No, you, no, no, it's your show. But what I'm trying to say... <laughs> what I'm trying to say, actually, is that I did do, for the first time in my life, a young and an old of the particular person. We did a young Harold Wilson and an, uh, 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 an old, a ma mature Harold Wilson. I think that is a more polite way of putting it. 
And it did come off. I enjoyed doing it. And we had a lady, an actress called Margaret John, who played the part of your wife, who came in and played uh, uh, the, uh, the part of your wife in the, in the actual sketch. Thank you, Mike Elwood. Now a lady. No, it's not Janet Brown. It's my favourite poet. We've met before. <laughs> You've got a new book coming out. I've got a new book coming out. For greater accuracy, as they say in the uh, House of Commons, I've actually got a copy of your book. I've got one too. Snap. <laughs> um, now, why do you like to see your work in print? Everybody does who writes, but why do you like to see your work in print? Well, I think everybody that writes likes to see their work in print, and that's why an awful lot of people actually pay for their work to be printed, just to see, to feel the book and to see it on, and the work on the printed page. And I remember when I went down to Tiptree when my first book came out, and I actually saw it coming off the presses, and I held it in my hand as it came off, and, um, well, I, I said, and in my life, the, the most emotional moments were the moments when my children were born and my young family was growing up. So I thought a bit and I said, this is the most exciting and thrilling thing that's happened to me in the last 10 years, and that was in 1970. 19... 1970. Yes, you didn't mention 1964. Well, that was it. <laughs> Did you, Mike? <laughs> Well, uh, 1964, uh, that was a very good year. Yeah, very good year. Vintage year. Vintage year. Yeah. Yes, well, it, I realised what I said. I said, my goodness, what have I said? My husband became Prime Minister in 1964. But... Then I withdraw what I've just said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that in, as a joke. <laughs> as a what? As a joke, Mr. I... Day. Mr. Day, ever heard of jokes, Mr. Day? <laughs> Robin not not legend. Jerk. Robin not thought legend. you said jerk. That was jerk. He, oh, he thought legend. I said jerk. Oh well, I was. I was. <laughs> now, um, I hope you've chosen a poem to read to us before we go off there. Yes, I, I've. <laughs> as prearranged, I have chosen a, a poem to read to you, and <laughs> about this poem, it's not full of poetic plights of fancy. It's not an esoteric poem of any kind. I wanted to keep it really simple and I wanted to dedicate it to all the wonderful and rather um, independent and astringent old ladies. We've met many of them over the years. And because uh, this is London, I thought it would be rather nice to read a poem called The Old Woman of Peckham. My life is made of shadows which move across a screen Sometimes they bring back memories of all the things I've seen. They showed the war last evening, the mud and the very lights, and no man's land and the trenches. I remember the London nights with the troop trains in the darkness and the zeppelins overhead, the wounded on the stretchers and the dreadful lists of dead. The canteen at Waterloo Station and the soldiers wet and cold, hungry for love and excitement and one so handsome and bold held my hand with the teapot in it. I shall always remember that day. And he bought me a ring of garnets before he went away. On his next leave we were married. Oh, I can see us now. We went up west for our supper, then on to Chu Chin Chow. Thirty-five years we were married, snug in this little street, and even now I listened for his returning feet. We had plenty of jokes and laughter. I don't remember the tears. With the children growing round us, yes, those were happy years. We both worked hard for our living, but I really can't complain. He was with me through the bombing, and he went without much pain. The people from the welfare keep on calling on me, but I won't take anything from them, not even a packet of tea. They always seem to remind me that I live here all alone, that my children have married and left me, and my husband is dead and gone. Mother, come with us to New Zealand, but I didn't want to go. And I understood and don't blame them. They were glad when I said no. 
I tried not to show that I'd missed them when I waved them all away. I've always lived in London, and here I mean to stay. My neighbour fetches my pension, and she shops for this and that. But I don't let her over the doorstep. I keep her on the mat. She's a kindly soul, and I'm grateful, but I wouldn't call her a friend. I want to be independent, and to be so till the end. Someday soon I shall need them, those people who knock at my door, when the doctor on the telly can ease my pain no more. But when I have drawn my curtains and my fire is burning bright, I know I'll be able to manage for just another night. Well, my thanks to Mary, Mikey Arwood, Winston and Robin Day, and to our singers and the crew here at the BBC. Next week, members of the Sunday Times staff will be taking over the Friday night, Saturday morning studio. Good luck to them, and special good luck in the days immediately ahead. I'll be returning to the calmer environment of the back benches at Westminster. But thank you for looking in. Good night.